Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Disclosure Team channel. Thank you to everybody watching this live now. I see quite a few of you in the live chat. I really appreciate you being here. And to those watching this after the fact, thank you so much. And finally, hello to those listening to this on the Anomalous Podcast Network. For anybody that's new uh, to the channel, you can also follow me on Instagram and Twitter. The links are below in the description. But let's not waste any more time. We are here to speak to a gentleman who um, has done a lot for this subject, and I am just honored to be able to, to sit down and speak with him. So without further ado, please let me welcome Mr. John Alexander. Hello, John. How's it going? Pretty good. You? I'm really good. Thank you so much for agreeing to talk to me. It really means a lot. So thank you. All right. So, John, I just um, wanted to start off. Um, I've been watching a few interviews you've done in the past recently, and I keep coming across this statement that you, you've said a few times, that UFOs are real, but the phenomenon is more complex than we can imagine, and we're not asking the right question. Are you able to expand on that a bit for us, if you don't mind? Uh, well, of course. Um, first of all, uh, the follow-up question is usually what's the right question, and unfortunately I don't have a good answer for that. <laughs> um, when I'm doing my presentations, I have a slide uh, that I always start with, and it shows uh, UFOs, near-death experiences, remote viewing, uh, spontaneous healing, uh, even cryptozoology, uh, just a wide, wide range of certainly psychokinesis we've done a lot of work with. And my point there is that uh, the UFO phenomena, all of these, I believe, are interrelated and consciousness is a key piece uh, to that. Now, I, I also start with a UFO by asking a question that says, what do you mean? And by that, I address, you know, I got little balls of light, sometimes floating around the room. We've got hard craft miles across and thousands and thousands of variations in between. So what are you talking about? It's not that simple. I mean, everybody thinks of a little nuts and bolts, you know, hard craft zipping around. That would be, that's the easy part. But when you start dealing with people who say, I'm communicating, I have mental uh, experiences with them. They tell me when to show up. As you may know in my book, uh, well, do you know Chris Bledsoe? If Absolutely. Familiar with that case. Well, that's a, a, a chapter in my last book. Um, and the reason was we had gone down, and I'd interviewed Chris, had him on tape for hours. and go like, oh, this is really, really strange. <laughs> um, so we went down uh, to his house and we were spent several days with him and his family, great family and all of that. And so we went down to the Cape Fear River and uh, it was kind of late in the afternoon. We got down there and he was showing us uh, around and where the initial incident had occurred. There was a lot yes. of dramatic things that happened there. Uh, so then we went back up the hill, about a couple hundred meters maybe, uh, and it was now just getting dark, and my wife and uh, Emily, his daughter, were in the back of the car talking, and he and I were leaning against the hood, and he's describing, well, here's where this happened, and I saw the craft over here, etc. And then he said, oh, I think they're here. And within just a few seconds, this thing pops into view and goes zipping off. And it's a temporal relationship between him saying, I think they're here, and <laughs> the things that I saw, you know. So I can't, you know, this was, I always go by uh, firsthand experience. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that was real and for me. Now, <clears throat> if you know anything about the case, this thing went on and on, and one of the biggies uh, was that uh, after he had gotten home, this is after the, the first incident, uh, right. he had gotten home, and he saw something peeking on the window, and he goes out, and uh, it starts chasing him, and so he runs. At that time, he's not, not where he lives now, but the yard was about five acres. It was uh, pretty big, right? and so he's running down, and... 
entity catches up with them and Chris says, oops, you got me, you know that. And they said, you don't understand. We're here to help. And about that time, Chris Jr. shows up and entity disappears. Wow. Um, you fast forward to the next day and it's around noon and he suddenly says, gee, I haven't taken my medicine. And he had had serious Crohn's disease for 12 years at that time and has not taken another pill since. Wow. And of course, there's other healings that take place and, and whatnot. So <clears throat> like I say, it was my firsthand experience with that. Um, it was the second time ever that I have personally seen something. I would have studied you know, quite a bit of it, but uh, that's one where I actually saw the damn thing happen right in front of me. Wow, that's that's amazing. And do you still speak to Chris Christopher Bledsoe to this day? Oh, do you stay in touch? Time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, in fact, he is sending me, you know, at, at least every week I get videos that he's taking because he goes outside and this gets back to what's a UFO because he's seeing balls, you know, floating around. Yeah. Uh, and he believes communicating with him. Uh, but... Uh, and there's another individual now who's coming out of the scene and where they're talking simultaneously and they're quite a distance apart and both see the same wow. things. So, um, yeah, you know, that's uh, it's really a phenomenal case. Yeah, indeed, indeed. And you mentioned there that that was the second time you'd seen something. Are you able to Tell us what the first one was, by any chance. Oh, very, very minor. Um, I was up in Washington, up at uh, Jim Gilliland's place. I don't know if you're familiar with him, but that's an yeah. interesting case as well. And what had happened was I'd spent uh, sending several nights out there, and I happened to have third-gen uh, night vision equipment. And uh, everybody else was gone, and so I was out in the field watching and seeing these things go over and whatnot and saw the same company said that's a trajectory not quite right for a satellite uh but it was coming and then all of a sudden it stops and he said mm, satellites don't stop wow that's incredible uh, so listen, John, if it's okay with you, I'd like to take you back a few years to, to where your interest really came from with regards to the, both the UFO phenomena and uh, the paranormal. Do you, you know, if you could just sort of take us back to, to where it all began, that would be great. Long before you were born. <laughs> Actually. No, it was. Um, I went to a very unusual grade school. Uh, we were part of what has now become the University of Wisconsin at La Crosse. And it was a teacher's college. And they had a bunch of kids there. We were the guinea pigs that the student teachers would learn how to teach. And we were, because of that, we happened to have a, a phone system or a broadcast system that was inside that broadcast you know, to the entire school. And my first recollection on that, 1947, is actually giving a talk about UFOs. It's just as they were beginning, you know, let's uh, beginning to come into public awareness. Right. And so that's the first uh, first active recollection that I have was ten at the time. And, uh, wow. Yeah, that's it a, does go back that far, and it's kind of hit and miss. It's, it, as I like to tell people, it, it's not like I had an epiphany like some people do where they have a sudden shift in consciousness. It's kind of more like steering an aircraft carrier where you're seeing slight changes as we go on. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's move forward um, into your, your military career. Did you experience anything, uh, again, paranormal or related to the UFO phenomenon while you were serving? Well... I think you know that I created what we call the Advanced Theoretical Physics Project. Indeed. And that was after doing some other things. You know, I'd had some minor personal experiences like in Vietnam and, and things of that nature that others report on. Uh, but uh, no, my career was very unusual and I would not recommend it for people who want to you know, make a military career and go down there. I was extraordinarily lucky as to, you know, 
who I came in contact with and, and how, particularly after I got into the uh, Pentagon. I was already a lieutenant colonel uh, by that time. And um, one of the key things that happened was that uh, I was invited to meet with the uh, Deputy Secretary of Defense. And anybody who knows anything about the Pentagon knows that lieutenant colonels do not meet with DepSec Def alone. Uh, <laughs> But that is what happened, and we were. I was assigned as an inspector, Army Inspector General. And there are bottles in the Pentagon, and that's where the uh, my office was. Um, I mean, we used to, it's like more like as a office, more like stanchions. You know, we used to move when we go in. <laughs> if you're a lieutenant colonel of the Pentagon, you're you're in the Munchkin level for sure. Um, but anyway, uh, so we had a very interesting conversation, and he, he was about this, how that came about. It's a little extraordinary as well. But so he's asking questions about, you know, interest and in paranormal things. And says, "Well, who do you work for?" and all of that. And I said, "Well, I'm down there." As, as this was about, I met him at about uh, twelve thirty. And went on till one, and I went back to my office and said, well, that was interesting. Wonder, wonder what that was. Um, and at 425, the uh, chief of staff uh, of the IG shop came in and said, tomorrow morning, you don't work here anymore. You had moved wow. me that fast. Gosh. Yes. Okay. <laughs> And so let's say the rest is history. Initially, I worked with uh, Max Thurman, who later became the vice chief of staff of the army. And he's the guy who ran Southcom during the invasion of Panama and all that, who was personally interested. And then uh, then moved to uh, under Bert Stubblebein, who was then the commanding general of intelligence and security command. And that's where the RV programs, and we did a lot of other stuff. I want to be clear, I was not involved in uh, what became known as Stargate, but we were doing right. lots of other kind of unusual things at the time and became cognizant of what they were doing. Right, right. And you mentioned remote viewing there. Um... I mean, it's a subject that I'm, you know, I, I'm quite nuts and bolts UFO with my backgrounds, but I'm trying to learn more about the the different aspects with the, the, the psychological and the consciousness. So can you give us a bit of a description about the re remote viewing and when the program started and your involvement and some of the key players in it? Well, A, I was not directly involved until IRVA came along, uh, International Association of Remote Viewing Studies, and I was a founding board member uh, of that. Uh, many of these people are personal friends. Of course, they'll know about uh, Joe McMonagall and Paul Smith and uh, some others I, I won't name. Uh, but certainly became personal friends with uh, Ingo Swan, who was one of the key wow. people. Of course, Hal Putoff and Russ Targ, who were the guys at SRI who got that going. Some will know Kit Green, who was uh, CIA uh, uh, interface uh, with that, or one of them. There was another one, uh, Ken Gress, who was actually out as a CTOR at uh, Stanford. Um, so, yeah, it's, I uh, forget exactly uh, when it started in the 70s, had been moving forward. It has various names uh, over time. Um, my shorthand is we're talking about psychic spying. Uh, yes, it works sometimes. Uh, I, I get in trouble with the community because some of them are now it's 100% accurate. And, uh, <laughs> now it doesn't, doesn't work that well, but uh, sometimes it works. And dealing with the scientific community, they go, well, you know, what's the theoretical basis uh, for this? And I go, well, we don't really have a good theoretical basis, but we had an operational capability. Right. And they were doing things for various clients uh, in the uh, community. It is a whole host of books that are out uh, describing many of the things that were done. Yeah. And was a lot of the research for improving like soldiers on the battlefield was that the main you know focus at first or were there other no, aspects no, no, not, not at all 
And but one of the things we point out is the psychic experiences, you know, they happen in general public. Well, they happen in the military, which is actually part of the general public as well. Yeah. So when you get into and I've talked to battlefield experiences and my personal one that uh, happened is probably life saving, uh, if not limb saving. But um, uh, there are hosts and hosts of anecdotal stories of people who see things, who sense danger. There was something well known as the uh, point man syndrome and what troops know. You know, the point man is the guy who's leading you down the trails where, wherever you're going. And yeah. they tend to learn that some people, if they were out there, you were safe and others are likely more likely to bumble into something. So there were people who were more sensitive to impending danger. Not not well studied, but kind of anecdotally at least very well known. Yeah, you just mentioned there this one time that it actually saved your life. Now, I'm aware of this, this incident, but if you're happy to share it, I'd love for, for other people to hear about it, if you don't mind. Yeah, well, we were, uh, it was obviously in, in Vietnam, and out on a patrol, and uh, we got into an area that uh, it was a contested area. Now, we knew this the whole area well enough that we could call fire from, you know, w without looking at a map. We knew exactly where we were. We knew where there were, et cetera. And so anyway, uh, we got into an area and I'm starting to, this, it's getting sensitive and I'm starting to back up. And uh, all of a sudden, we stopped. And somebody's yelling, mean, mean, mean. And uh, a, a tripwire was across the back of my heel as I've already started to pull. And um, yeah, uh, another inch or so. And certainly, legs would not be in the shape they are today. Wow. Yeah, that's incredible. Just to hear it, you know, face to face is, uh, whew, yeah. Very close call. <laughs> um, and also, I believe dowsing was used in Vietnam as well. And are you able to sort of talk about any success or the success levels of, of actually using dowsing? Uh, actually, not very well. Now, the problem here, again, is that it's very anecdotal. Right. Now, they did it at uh, Seaborg Harbalek was the head of the American Dowsers uh, Association. And he happened to live near Fort Belvoir, and they actually uh, set up a course down there and taught people how to do dowsing. Uh, remember, one of the things that we were always looking for is these underground either tunnels, bunkers, or caches where various sorts of things would be stored. And uh, so they had uh, built at Belvoir a place and taught soldiers how to go in. As far as I know, unfortunately, there was no real follow-up as to, yes, these people deployed and, you know, did they find things? But it, it, it was not a, methodical, a methodal, methodological process where they, you know, collected data and came back and said, you know, here's the efficacy of the program or whatnot. Um, but, I mean, there's lots of people. But in addition, we had lots of people who came into the military who had had dowsing experience at home and just did it and it was an application. Uh, again, not really recorded, unfortunately, because it did happen uh, more more than a lot of people know. But Yeah. And were there any other areas of the kind of um, psychological um, areas of research or the paranormal that you that the military were interested in, you know, over the years that, that you can talk about? Well, first of all, you know, I've got a slide uh, that I use uh, all the time in the briefing. It says the Pentagon says, and my point is the Pentagon says nothing. It's a big stone building. So <laughs> when you ask, what does the military do? Eh, that's not really so much it as people in the military who have right. these experiences and do these things. Um, so again, like the general public, uh, vast numbers of the military have some kind of psychic experiences. 
uh, throughout uh, their careers. Um, unfortunately, being a very conservative community, uh, you've got some other people who don't want to hear about those things as well. And they come from a very materialistic paradigm that says, you know, we, we're not going to deal with weirdness and, yeah. and don't want that out there. So, and you do have, and admittedly, we ran into the situation, you know, excuse me. Yeah. Don't want to start sneezing here, um, but, but anyway. Uh, but uh, the uh, conservative Christian group that says you can do that, but it's the work of the devil, right? And uh, that was a very real component in a number of these. Uh, you know, you know, there was an argument that was put up many times by not so much skeptics, but uh, people who did not want any. Uh, engagement in the area, and some of these were very senior folks. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now you're a big advocate for for the use of non-lethal weapons. Um, um, are there, is this physical weaponry as well as sort of psychological warfare? Well, let's say not psychological warfare at all. Right. I mean that, that part of, or psychic warfare, any of that. That's just not involved. What we're talking about. Uh, are very physical weapons from simple things that you know about. In the UK used to talk about rubber bullets uh, all the time. Right. You remember uh, all of that. But uh, pepper sprays and tasers, uh, all of those things that are popularly known, all the way up to the high end, what we call strategic incapacitation, where we're going after a target set like a nation state and bringing that down. And, what you're doing is degrading the infrastructure, uh, but without doing it, without bombing them into oblivion. I can give you a specific example there. Electricity is something they go after all the time. Now, if you bomb generation capabilities on that, the long lead time in recovery is months to years. And so with many people or situations what you want to do is to bring it down temporarily but you want to restore the facilities as quickly as possible uh, after that so that's the kind because you weren't looking for a secondary or tertiary casualty you want to be able to control the situation at least temporarily yeah but yeah. that most of the emphasis clearly is on the anti-personnel system we're going to do riots and things like that but it it crosses a much broader spectrum yeah absolutely um just for everybody who's asking questions uh, in the live chat i will save all the questions i've got them in a little file here to the side and i will ask them towards the end of the interview uh, so thank you um john now we can't have this conversation without talking about nids and skinwalker ranch um it's a fascinating subject that still to this day is being researched and looked at uh, and the phenomenal things that that happen there are you able to take us back to when you were first introduced you know to robert bigelow and 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 became a part of nids well yeah that's another serendipitous set of experiences that it is no we first met very very briefly at a conference that uh, john mack was having at mit on the abduction phenomena yeah. uh, what i did not know at the time is that literally a couple of weeks before his son had died um and then we fast forward a year or so uh, I was having a number of people in, some of whom would recognize Hal was there and, and some others at my house. And I was at, now I'm out of the military, by the way, I'm working at Los Alamos National Laboratory. That's where the non-lethal connection is. Right. Um, but I lived in Santa Fe uh, and drove up the hill every day. And um, it was Sunday morning, and we had been talking for a couple of days on a variety of projects. And out of the blue, I get a phone call where the people are just gathering. We're getting ready to drive back to Albuquerque for flights. And it was uh, Robert Bigelow. And he says, hi, I'm me. I've heard something about you. Uh, do you have any projects that might need funding? 
I said, well, funny you should mention it, but standing in my kitchen right now, you know, are these groups of folks. And uh, anyway, this went back and forth. He had later flown over to Santa Fe and we talked and met with some interest in uh, taking the um, Santa Fe Institute, uh, which was dealing with chaos theory and things like that. And we thought about buying in and go like, Murray Gelman, who was a Nobel physicist, who was kind of a strong character, this is not going to be a good match. So he decided to uh, create NIDS, and I was just leaving, retiring from Los Alamos, the second formal retirement. And uh, from that, um, came over here and set up NIDS, and they say the rest is history. But a but very interesting history. Absolutely. I mean, did you? How much time did you get to spend on the ranch? You know, while the investigations were happening, and did you experience anything while you were there? Um, well, first of all, I was with Bob the day that he actually bought the ranch. Right. He went back to a hotel, and I spent a night up on the uh, North uh, Mesa uh, along there. Uh, the main thing I experienced there was a lot of mosquitoes. <laughs> uh, which came in in, in the evening. Um, I have been there some time, but not nearly as much time as uh, like Colin Kelleher or Eric Davis uh, actually spent. George Annette were the ones who spent far more time on a ranch. I was up uh, several times. Um, the short answer, no. Uh, and that includes, I was just back uh, for filming. They're doing, as you know, the Skinwalker Series three is coming out, and I assume I will appear in that. I was up uh, for the filming. Oh, but, absolutely. Uh, uh, no, I will say that we did find that there were some people who were more sensitive to this phenomenon than others. And there's a brand new book out called The Skinwalkers uh, at, at the Pentagon. Uh, this written by uh, Colm and uh, George Knapp and one other person from GIA whom I do not know, have, have never met him. James they Lekansky. describe uh, yeah, a whole series of very, very unusual events, even probably more dramatic. But what was more significant about that and Colm and I have discussed this uh, over time. Uh, some other incidents we've happened in South America and Africa and places well, like that. But, um, you know, the question is, did you bring anything home? Uh, apparently these guys, many of them did have very significant phenomena follow them home. Yeah, that does seem to be a big key component, the, the hitchhiker phenomena, yeah. which I think does from what we hear continue to this day to some degree with what we saw in the in the news in the, the series uh, that, that we see from brandon fugel um so do you still speak to colin kelleher and, and people like that uh, and get sort of uh, not since yesterday <laughs> i mean that man you know that i'd love to have a chat with him so uh yeah maybe in the future um well he still works with bob you know, they, they have now formed the Bigelow Institute of Consciousness Studies, which you're probably familiar with the uh, uh, essay contest that, that just went on. So he, um, I was proposing to him, uh, uh, the Journal of, for the Society of Scientific Exploration would like a guest essay on the, uh, uh, how the Bix con essay contest came about. And, I, I turned them down, but suggested that Cullum might be the the best person for it, and uh, so he's exploring that. But he does go back and check with Bob before doing anything like this. Yeah, that was a, a great competition, and with a with a, a worthy winner in uh, Jeffrey Mishlov. I think yeah. it was uh, really well. Yeah, received. Jeff's a good friend. Jeff used to live just a couple of miles from where I'm at now. He's now moved over to Albuquerque, right? But uh, all in here. Uh, he had a phenomenal advantage, though, because he had been working for decades on something called new, uh, Thinking Aloud, uh, A-L-L-O-W-E-D. 
Yeah. And uh, that uh, the people he had interviewed is just a phenomenal list. And he's now got a whole program up called New Thinking Aloud. And probably, yeah, I'm sure the folks in your audience ought to look that up because there's just a whole host of interviews that he's been able to conduct. And uh, I've done several with him uh, as well, both here and uh, when we were visiting in Albuquerque. Yeah, it is. It's a fascinating conversation. All the different interviews he does. He's had Colin Kelleher on. I watched that one a couple of days ago. I will add the link into the description for everybody uh, after this. the interview's finished. Um, so yeah, that was fascinating. Thank you, John. Let's move up to uh, more modern times and 2017 and and the kind of wave of you know the way the UFO community is going. What were your uh, what were your thoughts and views when 2017 and the New York Times article broke? Well, I only had a short link. I was not involved in the OSAP program or any of those. Yeah. Um, and uh, of course, in the meantime, I had put out uh, UFOs, myths, conspiracies, uh, and realities. Um, I guess I've been every carry it forward. I, I was not surprised. Uh, and I've actually looked this up. And if you look at, take the end of Blue Book, you're familiar with the Blue Book study. Yeah. And you move forward where the government was not involved. Now, <clears throat> there's over 600 individuals who have become flag officers, generals or admirals uh, since that time. <clears throat> Assuming they're like the general public, probably somewhere around 60, some of them, maybe more, have had personal experiences. So my question is not why does did this occur, it's why haven't there been more? Why isn't there more interest as opposed to less? Uh, one of the things that I had done with the program that I ran, I ended up talking to the director, deputy director of those three letter agencies you think you know about. <laughs> uh, but one of them that was key, that um, it's an agency that would have to be involved in, you know, if you hear about teams going out and all of oh, that stuff. And what they said was, a, we don't do that. There's no requirement to do it. B, I'll tell you about the ones I saw. So here's the guy, head of an agency who had had personal experience many years before. He said he'd seen things flying around. He said he knew exceeded the capability of anything that, that we had. And, and yet that does not translate to we'll do something about it. And I do argue a long time, there's a huge difference between individual interest and institutional responsibility. Sure. So just, just because people are interested does not mean and, that you see this extrapolated frequently that, you know, there, therefore you got this guy who does this, so therefore that you know, doesn't follow. Yeah, absolutely. But do you think there are projects or black projects or special access programs where they do know something they do know that these craft are not from here well that's barely been publicly acknowledged i mean most of us when i put my group together i had representatives from all of different services from the intelligence community from uh, aerospace uh, that was doing it, <clears throat> and they all had to have top secret and SCI level clearances. Everybody knew the folklore. You know, the bottom line was everybody was saying, I thought you had that. You know, no, don't you actually doing this? I thought, you know, it would be here. And my bottom line that I still maintain is, but for most of the time, nobody's minding the store. It's far more anecdotal. It doesn't mean that things didn't happen. You've heard of Malmstrom and you know the huge uh, you know, faded giant and Bob Salas and that. Did they study it? Yes. Did it go in it? And, and this is one of the key things. I drop back to the remote viewing program. Sure. Uh, you know that was what we call a program or record, meaning it was constituted, it was fully funded. Uh, yes, it was, you know, behind the doors, but you know, it was there and it was formal. 
as opposed to the host of things like things we did that were not formalized. And uh, yeah, it, and what I have found across the board is you have people who have these experiences, get interested, they'll go so far. Uh, and the thing you can muck about in, when you understand funding and all of that, there's so much of uh, uh, discretionary funds uh, that are available, but as you get higher and higher, you get more uh, scrutiny and more people start fighting over it. Uh, my key story there is I had ended up with Jim Abramson, who was then running uh, Star Wars, the SDI program. And uh, at that time, we had decided to transition from, okay, we're doing this ad hoc, let's you know, try to formalize it. And his response was uh, quite telling and appropriate. And I think a warning for some of the things that are coming out now. And that was, <clears throat> hey, I'm kind of, it says I'm an old fighter pilot, and you kind of got my attention here after we didn't initially. Well, we started this with an interview, uh, and I, I had opened it up, and we were going around the room, and all of a sudden, you know, wait, 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 who are you guys really? <laughs> you know, like this, <laughs> he did not know the topic before we met. And went back, and we finally talked about a whole host of things. And so, okay, he got my attention. So, well, we'd like to transition. And we go, look, I'm doing some hairy stuff now. And he had a $5 billion budget. Wow. Which was the biggest defense project at, at that time. And it was, if I get caught doing this, you know, they're going to nail my budget. And he did get cut a billion. He says, I just can't uh, can't touch this. But he said, now, if you can tell me what to look for, because we're going to be monitoring more of space. And one of our concerns, of course, was that you could accidentally trigger something by having you know something attributed to Soviet. This was the bad old days. Uh, you know, you, you might trigger something accidentally. You really ought to be able to tell the difference between a UFO event and, uh, you know, a potential incursion. Um, but anyway, it turned us down specifically because they would not be seen as stewards of uh, you know, public funds. And I've been yeah. attacked by uh, in Scientific American and uh, Bullet of Atomic Scientists and all that personally. And you know, the same thing should not be because you have beliefs in these areas. Therefore, you can't be a good manager. Yeah, well, it happens. Yeah. Um, so let's bring it back up to, to last year, 2021, and the release of the um, the preliminary assessment from the UAP task force. What were your thoughts when you first saw that document? Because it was a split. You know, a lot of people just thought it was nothing. And, and other people felt yeah. like the, there was quite a, a lot of tells in there. I, um, <laughs> my. I have given a couple of briefings on it and uh, have a picture there of a big nothing burger. <laughs> I mean, basically all of the information that was certainly in the public variety was publicly known. Uh, having said so, I mean, it's still interesting that you did get official confirmation, yea, verily, is real. So that is a, a step forward. Um, now, where I get into a lot of trouble is when we say, well, where should you go? Now, I do think the military has a role, and they bring to the table sensor systems that are not available you know, to the general public and whatnot. Sure. Having said that, I think that the issue is so broad, if you get back to the consciousness relation and all that, other than direct intervention with military craft and things of that nature, I'm not convinced the government has a role on the broader scope. Now, I'll take a step ahead and tell you what I do think ought to happen. I, I, my approach to this is something like the Human Genome Project, if right. you're familiar with that, terribly complex Indeed. and was resolved uh, you know, under budget and ahead of schedule. But the approach was that you have many countries are involved, you have various universities bringing together the best and the brightest, 
and most importantly, data sharing. And the sure. biggest problem that I say from a military perspective uh, so far, and I understand why, because knowledge is power. And so you have the lack of data sharing, which is the antithesis of what's needed to address these issues. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we've just seen the the latest um, National Defense Authorization Act passed with uh, the amendments in it to set up this new yeah. UAP office, which does feature sharing with allies, you know, like the Five Eyes community. Do you think that that may still turn out to be to go nowhere or, or do you have any kind of hope? For that project or, or that amendment let's say yeah very mixed uh, well again it gets back to uh, you know i think serious data is going to be withheld uh yeah. you just don't have oversight the other is a key issue and i don't know who but who is involved and one of the problems we've had in all studying all of these phenomena is they want to bring in supervisors and boards that are unbiased, meaning they're not unbiased. They generally don't know anything about the topic. And, you know, if I'm going to go in for brain surgery, I do not want a surgeon who's unbiased. I want somebody who really <laughs> knows the, the topic and uh, have interest. Uh, but you got to remember, you're dealing with micro belief structures here because vast majority of the military and scientific community comes up in a system that, you know, purely mechanistic, uh, it's the way the world works, and it doesn't. <clears throat> but you're looking at, you know, these terribly complex uh, subjects, and should you be involved? So you bring in a belief system that says it can't be, therefore it isn't, I'll, I'll also mention, because it may come up, and that's I come down against the ETH, or the extraterrestrial hypothesis. Yeah. But that is the direction they will go, because if not here, then from where and what. And my point here is there have been reports of interactions between humans and sentient non-human beings throughout the entirety of human history and in all yeah. cultures and that. So it's obviously what's going on is far, far broader than little gray guys from the Zeta Reticuli. Yeah. So you do you think you would put that hypothesis? I mean, we have so many different possibilities with the crypto terrestrial, the ultra terrestrial, interdimensional. Yeah. So do you would you put the extraterrestrial hypotheses underneath those other ones? Oh, it's one. No, if the question is, <clears throat> is there intelligent life in the universe someplace? The answer is yes. And right. you don't have a belief system about that. That's pure math. Just the, right. the numbers yeah. of billions of inhabitable uh, planets that, that exist out there, where would they be in the process of evolution and whatnot? <clears throat> yeah, the probability of it is definitely yes. Now, does it fit in all of those others? And that's where I get into, you know, what we're looking at is far more complex than we can imagine. Yeah, yeah. Now it goes back to our opening question. Right. Um, so yeah, and I think it, it, it we can't answer it at the moment. I mean, maybe there are people out there who do know more than we hear, but you know, we don't, <laughs> or I certainly don't. Well, I can't speak I, I, for you. If you drop back to the the Bix essay contest, right? Uh, <clears throat> and I know what you know, Jeff would, and I was talking to you know Raymond Moody. It was the guy who kind of created the whole field. Or he, was, he and my mentor uh, were the ones who came up with near-death experiences. And so back, we were talking in, in the 70s. Right. And I was talking to Raymond about it. And he actually does courses in uh, nonsense. And his point here is Aristotelian logic is probably incapable of solving the kinds of problems that we're being faced with. Right, right. Well, that's absolutely fascinating. That I've, I've got a couple of my questions left, but I'm going to take some time just to jump to some of the questions we've had uh, in the live chat here. Um, so apologies, John, if any of these kind of do kind of cover some of what we've talked about, but I'll, I'll read them anyway. Um, so Walker Dale, uh, and thank you for the $5, says, 
I'm just wondering, does John think we will see government confirmation of a non-human intelligence presence here on Earth in the next few years? No. No? Um, now, you should note that there was a pool of, uh, uh, I guess it was a Gallup poll that was out asking about intelligent life in the universe and, and what people thought. And one of the things they found was 20% of the global population believed that ET was here. I mean, so here walking among us and all that. So that's part yeah. uh, of it. Uh, but I, do I think that there's going to be a formal recognition of anything like that? And again, I, I, I don't think it's ET just walking around. You've got too many other possibilities that you've uh, eliminated. Uh, but I don't see the government. Uh, <clears throat> there's no upside for them doing that. Uh, Fair enough. Yeah. Yeah. And particularly I if you're getting get back to funding. If you get off into those areas, people are going to say, what are you doing with public funds? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the next question comes from that UFO lady. And, and thank you for your kind donation. Uh, can John relay his experience and thoughts regarding the lady? Bledsoe encounter. Yeah, I'm um, sorry, Joe. Um, <clears throat> I, obviously, I've heard about it. It is something that Chris talks about of having seen the lady. He talks about now the orbs that are there that he communicates with and that they are sentient beings communicating it. Uh, but beyond what Chris has said, not really. I, this is not something that I have personally experience right. uh, but I have come to trust his discussion of these things like I say after having the, the small experience that I did have uh, um, very interesting excellent and of course excellent. one of the things you mentioned is that there's a lot of healing that's uh, associated with it. it used to be that he had a tree uh, in the backyard very unusual one that had burned literally from the inside out and when it caught fire uh, and people would send stuff uh, when I was there, there was all kinds of clothing that people had sent in that wanted healing and then it would be exposed and then sent back. Well, and the, 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 the clothing would then hold healing powers. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, that, that's what it was. Yeah. Yeah, basically, wow. yeah. So the, the people thought that that was uh, true. I mean, uh, the whole notion of, you know, religious artifacts that have healing power has been uh, around for centuries. Of course. Yeah, absolutely. And the next one comes from Adam Reed. He says, I don't have any questions for Mr. Alexander. Would just, would just love you to let him know that he has some fans in Hull in the UK. So there you go. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah. um, the next one is from ALM, Alien Lives Matter. He asks, John comments on Robert Dean, Command Sergeant Major of NATO UFO report he spoke on. I not really, I don't really understand the question there. Can John comment on Robert Dean's UFO report? Does that ring any bells? It does, and <clears throat> I try to be kind, but I guess bullshit would be my uh, <laughs> technical explanation. <laughs> hey, say it like it is. Don't yeah. hold back. <laughs> no, that's fair enough. Um, well, I, I maybe the way one of the things I should mention, I was in a uh, course at Harvard. Uh, for senior executives and uh, we had working groups and it turns out one of the individual in my working groups <clears throat> went on to be the deputy commander at, uh, at NATO where Dean says this information came from. Um, so I happened to be uh, in Mons and stopped in and talked to him about this. I mean, they already knew I was crazy and we got uh, by the way, the reason the deputy commander is always an American has to do with nuclear weapons, because okay. you can't. You have people, other ones in uh, NATO, but they do not have command of nuclear systems. So that that's why this guy was uh, always there. 
but asked him uh, about this specifically. Uh, if it's there, it certainly did not rise up to the senior leadership. Right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Excellent. Um, the next one comes from Jay Allen. He says, we know from the Skinwalkers at the Pentagon book that Joe McMonagall did remote view the Skinwalker property officially but we don't have access to that data. Any comments? Well, those are all, pro what do you mean, officially? I guess it's part of sure. a program or, or, or yeah, under... It, it may be. Uh, no, there's a lot of information. Uh, most of it, remember, is privately held. And uh, that's been one of the problems with dealing with some of these areas where you have the government, you move it to a contractor, who is not subject to the FOIA, or the Freedom of Information cool. Act. And uh, uh, you know, one of the things Bob does not do is talk a lot. <laughs> that would have yeah. been in, in his domain. Absolutely. In the NIDS, was it, would that have been the NIDS days with McMahon? No, no, this is, this is after, although. Or would it be all sap with we, the Bass Actually, it's, uh, I believe it's both. I believe right. it's both because uh, well, I, I was in touch with Joe and I think we did have him do stuff uh, before that. Uh, yeah, one of the great remote viewers out there. Right, yeah. Um, Shardle, thank you so much for your donation. Um, he says Roswell 1947, Hopkinsville 55, and Kecksburg 65, all ca cases with claims of military retrieval of crashed UFOs stored in Wright Patterson Air Force Base. Are you aware of such claims? Certainly aware of the claims. Um, a, Roswell happened. B, in my opinion, it's not ET. It was us. Uh, oh. And certainly was recovered uh, and heavy-handed. Uh, I mentioned I was at uh, Los Alamos. Uh, and part of it was I was there in the... Hazel O'Leary's Truth and Reconciliation, where they, and they were talking about this. And all of the interviews, I had seen several of them, started with, it was a different time. And certainly at the end of the, uh, World War II, it was a different time. Our notion of what was going on, I'm, I'm young enough, or old enough to remember duck and cover and things like that. I mean, we thought the Soviets were going to send nuclear weapons over some of them in, planes they didn't have or missiles that didn't exist at, at that time and everybody was worried about it so the ability of the government to be very heavy-handed at that time was very real and i think that was true i have seen the stuff on kecksburg i'm not as convinced um, on that but i will say when you get to Roswell, no matter what you do or how you slice that, the data never all fit in a simple answer. Yeah, no, I understand. Um, finally, this last question comes from my good friend, Lara, who, funny enough, her husband actually works at uh, Los Alamos. Um, Lara says, does Mr. Alexander believe that Los Alamos National Labs is still doing research on the various phenomena? And if so, can you speak about it? Uh, a, I retired from there in 95, went back a couple times. Uh, as far as I know, they were never, well, that's not true. Uh, a few minor projects, for instance, uh, in a remote viewing program, I think we were looking at uh, magnetoencephalography, i.e., you know, but that was a contract work as opposed to at the laboratory, had a number of friends. I mean, obviously, I knew these folks, uh, many of them with personal interests, but that generally does not, trans again, does not translate into institutional interest or responsibility. Right, right. I've got to ask this one because this kind of made me smile inside. Megan T with the $5 donation says, is he Jonathan Axelrod? Is what? Uh, are you Jonathan Axelrod? You know, the oh, mysterious. Uh, no, uh, I don't know who it is. I do know a bit about him, but uh, definitely is, is not me. <laughs> okay, thank you. There you go, Megan. Um, and finally, John, I, I've got one last question for you. Um, 
and I ask this to a lot of my guests, is do you have a favorite UFO uh, case, whether it be something that you think is genuinely an anomalous case or just a story that is so out there that it just sticks in your mind? Well, obviously my personal favorite is Bledsoe. <laughs> That's because of the personal uh, interactions with that. Uh, but again, there are so many, and you can never get into can you top this? I mean, it's, there are so many phenomenal uh, cases that are out there. Uh, what I do say is that when you want one with highest credibility, I put Rendlesham right. there. Uh, of course, I've been with Chuck Halt and know a number of the people involved. Uh, the physical evidence uh, that's supportive uh, of the case and it's one that over time has improved and more and more highly credible witnesses uh, that uh, have come forward so when i get asked about you know what, what are the credible cases that's certainly the one that uh, that i would lead with frankly excellent great answer i like that one it's a big case for me as well being from the uk myself yeah. so fantastic well, so much that remember the, the you certainly did not know that Bent Waters was a nuclear storage facility, most forward one at the time, which is kind of interesting and critical to the uh, story. And, and Chuck, when he talks about it, you know, um, you know, was he debriefed on it? And that, the answer was no. His key story was I had contacted him. Um, from Los Alamos, and I was going to be in Washington in business and agreed to talk to him. And what he later said is, gee, I thought this was somebody coming to finally debrief him on the case. <laughs> I was there just to learn more information. Oh, that's brilliant. But yeah, I hope we, um, yeah, and you, as you say, it does keep evolving over the years, and, and that's so fascinating, absolutely. Well, listen, John, we're just, just shy of the hour mark, but I just wanted to say thank you so much. It's been a pleasure and an honor to speak to you. Um, so any any final words before we let you go and enjoy your day? No, I appreciate it. Thank you ever so much. You take care uh, and thank you again. All right. Bye. Bye. Well, guys, thank you to everybody that's here in the live chat for the questions, the donations. Um, I really appreciate it. And thank you so much to, to John Alexander as well. Um, I will be back on Thursday with Dr. David Clark to discuss Project Condine, DI-55 and UFOs in the UK. So um, go follow me on my social medias. Look out for all of the information. Thank you again, guys. And I'll see you later. Bye bye.